changes in Paul? <laughs> How much time do we have? I mean, let me tell you, before the conversion, you know, Paul's a great guy and all, and he's been my buddy a long time, but this is a guy who just demanded everything be the way that he thought it should be. We all have those friends, right? Well, that was Paul. After the conversion, <laughs> holy mackerel, let me tell you, after the conversion, he was a totally different guy. I mean, th this was someone who, who went from being the persecutor to the persecuted. He was the one who was trying to lead all of his friends, not just me, but everyone he would talk to. He tried to lead them to where God was. He tried to be the, the instigator for good, but not for his good, but for his good. It was an amazing transformation that, and it was long overdue, and, and he continues to be one of my best buds. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. You guys are super fast running Blooms Day. Well done. Um, my name is Isaac. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, I, I was backstage worshiping. I just ha had to, was so, I was thinking about how grateful I am. I don't often say this publicly. I should do it more often. But I'm so grateful for the worship team who has the skills and talent to lead us. They do a good job. I'm so thankful for the hours of sacrifice they do. I couldn't do it. A lot of you guys out there are out there saying we couldn't do it either, but we're so grateful for you guys leading worship, and thank you, worship team, and the tech team that makes it happen. It's beyond me. They start talking about things. You know, when computer guys and tech people start talking, I just nod and smile and get, figure it out. I don't know what they're talking about, but thank you for that. And the other thing I'm thinking of, too, is people who I'm grateful for, which, by the way, this has nothing to do with the message, but I was thinking of it. Um, we, some of you guys are really handy and love to serve. And I'm, again, grateful for you guys. Whenever anything breaks at my house, my kids start making phone calls because they know it's not me. I'm not joking. They'll say, can you please call? And they'll go down the line of people to call because they know it's going to be worse if I get involved. But uh, you guys that are handy, we actually could use some of you guys that are handy. We could use your help coming up. We, are, we have a child care center and a nursery. And one of the main rooms where the, where the babies are at it needs some attention and love. It, it hasn't been updated in a while. And there's kind of an aroma coming from the carpet. And there's a few things that just need some changing. So we're going we're gonna to paint it. We're going to tear out the carpet. But if you are able to help tear out carpet, lay floor, patch, paint, any of those kind of things, we could use your help. Jeff Shoup is going to be kind of coordinating all that. The dates that we're going to be using your help will be May 17th through May 27th. So see me or Jeff Shoup and we'll get you coordinated. So thank you for that. You guys are just, we have some talented, talented people here. So thank you. That has nothing to do with my message. Anyway, uh, I was just thinking about people I'm grateful for. One of my heroes is a man named Nicholas Herman. He wasn't an NBA basketball player or a YouTube sensation. He wasn't an actor, an author, or an athlete. He, in fact, he described himself as an awkward fellow who was prone to breaking things. Uh, Herman was born in France in 1611, and after he joined a monastery in Paris, he changed his name to Brother Lawrence. And it was here that Brother Lawrence lived his days, not as the abbot or the priest of the monastery, but as a simple and lowly dishwasher. So think Nacho Libre with the dishes. I mean, this guy's at the bottom of the monastery. But he wasn't famous while he was alive. What made Brother Lawrence famous was as he would live his life, he'd have conversations with people. And people were so encouraged and inspired by his conversations. They would leave that conversation and they would go write down what he said to them. Or when he was in his room, he would write letters to his friends and his friends would store his letters and keep his letters. And after he passed away, his friends gathered their notes, gathered his letters, and they compiled a little book that is still sold today called The Practice of the Presence of God. It's one of my favorite books. It's just really remarkable. But Brother Lawrence wasn't always a believer. He tells the story of when he decided to turn his life over to Jesus. This is what he said. God did me a glorious favor in bringing me to a conversion at the age of 18. In the winter, I saw a tree stripped of its leaves, and I knew that within a little time the leaves would be renewed. 
and that afterwards the flowers and the fruit would appear. From this I received a high view of the power and providence of God, which has never since departed from my soul. The view I grasped that day set me completely loose from the world and kindled in me such a love for God that I cannot tell whether it is, has increased during the more than 40 years since that time. What changed Brother Lawrence's life was not an incredible and powerful sermon. It was looking at a tree. While he looked at a tree, he sensed the power of God, the deep love of God, and said, I'm going with God for the rest of my life. He had this profound moment that changed the direct trajectory of his life. What moment changed the trajectory of your life? And most of us have these moments that will change us forever. Sometimes those moments bring devastation, and other times, like this with this tree, bring an incredible gift. We're starting a new series called Paul, A Submitted Life, in which we're going to look at the, the Apostle Paul, primarily in Acts, and we're going to start with his first moment, the moment that changed his life and really the rest of the world, and we're going to go through the next 30 years of his life until he ended up dying in Rome. And this, this week, though, we're looking at the, the con conversion story, his call to follow Jesus that changed him. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 9 today. I'm going to just read through different sections and highlight part of the passages of Scripture we go through here. So if you have your Bibles, either on your phone or in person on a book, we're going to be in Acts 9 all morning. Acts 9, 1 through 2 says this, But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So I'm just going to start with early Paul. I'm just going to make some observations about early Paul. If you're taking notes, you can make this point one, early Paul. What we first notice is we're reading about a man named Saul. Most of us know him as Paul. That's how he's become known throughout history. And this is a little bit confusing, but it is normal for, in this time, the Jewish men to have different names. They had a Greek name like Paul or a Jewish name like Saul. We see this with Matthew. Sometimes Matthew, the gospel writer Matthew, that was his Greek name, or he would go by occasionally his Hebrew name or Jewish name, Levi. This is totally normal for them to have a Greek name and a Jewish name. So early in Paul's ministry, he was known as Saul. That's what, if you see him today as I'm talking, we're reading, it'll be Saul in our scripture. I'll often call him Paul, though. And so that's just so that there's no confusion. That's who we're dealing with. Um, there was another famous Saul. He was the king of Israel, the very first one. That was about a thousand years ago, so don't be confused by that Saul. Two different men, a thousand years apart. We're talking about Saul or Paul in the New Testament. So this early Paul was an incredible young man. In Acts 23, Paul tells us that he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. Well, Gamaliel was the preeminent scholar in Hebrew in the first century. He was, he was an incredible man. He's, you're talking Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. That's where Gamaliel was. His grandpa, Hillel, was one of the great scholars of, of Jewish history and teachers. He, Gamaliel was an incredible rabbi. So when Paul says he studied at the feet of Gamaliel, what he's saying is, <clears throat> excuse me, he's saying, I was the best of the best of the best. Only the elite could study under Gamaliel. This is like for us getting degrees from Harvard and Oxford and, be, and then going back and teaching there. Paul is saying, I am educationally, religiously, and, and intellectually elite in the Jewish culture. Top level. That's where he was at. And so what's interesting here for us is that in order for... Paul to get to that status, he would have had to have almost all of the Old Testament memorized. Memorized. Some of us can barely get through John 3.16. If I quote it now, whenever I quote it on stage, I mess it up. I just, but Paul has it ingrained in him. And what's really interesting to me is he, so you can know something with your mind, but then to actually begin to live it out is different. And so Paul had engaged in scripture at a different level. So for the Jews, when they start uh, learning something, they learn by arguing and debating. So there's a Jewish saying that says, if there are 10 Jewish people, you have 11 opinions. And what they do is they argue and debate and they clash, and this helps them work through and learn the ideas. And so working, um, arguing with concepts helps us understand the subject even better. 
So for example, when I was in high school, I think the class that I learned the most in was chemistry. My chemistry teacher was an incredibly nice man. He, he was just re- remarkably kind. I really liked him. And after he would teach his lesson, he would allow us to break into groups. And the group that I was in had, a, had one guy whose favorite basketball player was Larry Bird, another one was Michael Jordan, and mine was Magic Johnson. And every single day, we would debate over who was the greatest basketball player of all time. And in this debate and arguing, uh, going back and forth throughout chemistry class of who was the greatest basketball player, I can tell you the arguments why Larry Bird and Michael Jordan are the greatest basketball players of all time, and I can tell you why they're flawed arguments. I've worked through that for a whole semester of chemistry class, and I know those debates well. See, what happens is when we begin to argue and debate, the ideas ingrain in our beliefs, and Paul had done that. He had argued through, he debated, he'd learned, and he studied the very best. Paul was incredible at Scripture. And what's important about that is when we read his words in in the letters, he's grabbing Old Testament passages of Scripture. He knows these well. He's putting them in. He's saying, let me explain this a little better. In Old Testament, this verse applies right here. And he just knows these arguments from Scripture. But not only was Paul extremely knowledgeable He was also incredibly passionate. Acts 9, where I just read it, it says, Paul, or Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He was breathing threats and murder against the followers of Jesus. He didn't just believe in an idea. He just didn't know the arguments. He was actively engaging and making those beliefs come about. So we are told earlier in Acts, that Paul helped participate in the first murderous persecution of a Christian. One of the first leaders of the church was a man named Stephen. He was preaching and teaching about Jesus in Jerusalem, and he was eventually seized by the Jewish council. Luke, who wrote Acts, said this in Acts 7.54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. Imagine being so mad at somebody, that you're grinding your teeth. How mad are you? How furious are you that you're just grinding your teeth, you're gnashing your teeth, and you're just angry? They're so enraged at Stephen's teaching about Jesus being risen from the grave, being the Son of God, that they they just can't help it. They grab him, and they drag him outside the city gates, and they start throwing rocks at Stephen until he eventually dies. This is where the religious leaders are at. And this is where Saul, or Paul, makes his first appearance. Luke writes in these verses in 758, Then they cast him out of the city, so they cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Saul is the coat collector. Hey, you want to throw rocks? I'll get you. Bring your coats. I'll hold your coats right here. He's collecting all the coats. He's making it possible for the men to throw rocks. Just a couple verses later, it says this in Acts 8.1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Saul makes possible the murder of Stephen by allowing the men to hold, to throw rocks. And it says he approved of it. And it was from that moment on that the the persecution of Christians really begins to skyrocket and ramp up. And Paul is actively participating in this. He is a main contributor to this persecution. He becomes fully engaged in this. He eventually obtains permission from the high priest named Caiaphas, probably Caiaphas, to go out, find Jews in other cities that are following Jesus, arrest them, bring them back for persecution and prosecution. So he's, he's really trying to limit the scope of, this, of these Jesus followers. And Paul would later write in Colossians about the type of behavior of people who, enca- who uh, before they encounter Jesus, before they've met Jesus, what that life looks like. And I wonder if he's thinking of himself as he's writing these words. Listen to what he says in Colossians 3, 7, and 8. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. 
To be clear here, Paul believed that he was following the way of God. He believed that the, the ones who were, that he was persecuting were idolatrous and blasphemous. He thought they were saying things about God that wasn't true, and so he was passionately about wiping them out. He wanted them to follow God as he believed was the correct way. He wanted everyone to follow the law. He, he sought holiness like no one you or I ever would, will know. No one followed the law. No one obeyed the Old Testament better than Saul that you and I will ever meet. What's interesting to me, though, is that on the outside, he was blameless. And he would say that in another passage of Scripture. He would say, before the law, I'm blameless. So if you look at his outside world, he looks perfect. On the inside, though, I have to wonder, was he full of anger, malice, slander, deceit, obscene talk? He, he may have looked good on, and holy on the outside, but on the inside, there was something really dark going on where he's actively seeking to kill people and persecute and prosecute them. And I wonder if we can look into our own lives and see anger and malice and envy and pride. And I wonder if we might uh, have fear. And on the outside, we look like we attend church on a regular basis and we dress nice and we don't use naughty language most of the time. And so we look like we're okay, but on the inside, not a pretty sight. If someone from the outside were to take a look at your life, how would they characterize your behavior? And you may feel it inside of your soul. You think you cover it well, uh, but you just can't shake this feeling that something inside is getting at you. Or you have it covered up. You think, I've got this problem dealt with until your spouse says or does something to you, and you just lose your mind. Or you're, somebody at work says something to you or does something, and you think that anger problem is resolved but then you start going behind their back because of what they did to you. And you, you don't do it to their face, but behind their scenes, you're cutting and taking them down and you're saying horrible things about them. And that old darkness just keeps creeping forward. That, sometimes that's what happens. You can, you can see it when you get stressed. When you get stressed, that old person comes back and you, there's a longing deep inside of you and you go, ah, I'm really stressed. Life is going really difficult. I'm going to go buy something, or I'm going to go eat something. And that darkness, that you're longing for something to take hold of you, and so you're going to fill that gap with something, whether it's taking somebody down, or being angry, or buying something, or eating in excess, whatever that is, you're filling the gap that should be God with other things. Paul he calls that the old man or the old woman. That's who we used to be, but when we, when we encounter Jesus, our life changed. We become a new creation, a new creature. The old man, the old person, the old woman is gone. We now are a new creation, and every once in a while, as we all know, things creep back in. So Paul, he has this experience, though, that changes the course of his life forever. So point two, if you're taking down notes, and he has an encounter with Jesus. Acts 2, I'm just going to read the second half of that, and through verse 6 says this. And he, was asked, and he asked him, Caiaphas, for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. So followers of Jesus at this time were not commonly called Christians. That comes later. What they're commonly called at this point in history is called followers of the way. You're followers of the way of Jesus. So catch this. I love this. Paul is on his way to persecute followers of the way. And I could do a whole Bible sermon on just that idea, but I'm going to try to keep it really brief. I think that's really interesting how he does that. And here's why I think it's interesting. Because we love things that are instantaneous. We love instant mashed potatoes. It just takes me four minutes. I pop them in the microwave and I am done. I love that. Uh, we love instant change. We love instant information. We love instant healing. We love Instagram. We love all things instant. See, we, we think if we skip one bowl of ice cream and we have one workout, I should look like a model. I should be able to pose for these magazines. I should post something on Instagram because I skipped a meal and behaved myself. We think 
if I reserve and keep my mouth shut one time, I've solved that anger problem because I believe in instantaneous. We want instant transformation. We want somebody to come into our life. We'll, we'll give you a weekend. And then we have that Jesus home edition makeover situation where my life is completely changed in one weekend. We like instantaneous transformation. That's where we're at. Unfortunately, life doesn't work that way. And I love the the name Christian, of followers of the way. Because to me, it points us towards progress. It points us towards a path and a road and that this is a way. It's a long journey. So there's a philosopher, you may have heard of his name. He's actually pretty anti-Christian. His name's Frederick Nietzsche. And he said this, I, this is so great that he used, he actually unintentionally used something that's important for us as Christians to listen to and he doesn't like Jesus at all. But listen to what he says. He says, the essential thing in heaven and on earth is that there should be a long obedience in the same direction. Thereby, and there has always resulted in, the long run, something which has made life worth living. Long obedience in the same direction makes life work worth living. Life is a long run. It does take us time. We travel to de- together for decades. We are all on a way, a path, a journey, traveling headed somewhere. And we do know that there are many paths that exist. You can choose a whole variety of ways to live. You can choose to follow money and influence or security or fear or worry. You can choose all kinds of paths to get somewhere. Some of us have tried these ways. We know we've tried to be busy and successful, but we've ended up unhappy. We've tried certain ways and we've ended up broke, broken, and lonely. We've ended up addicted and powerless. We end up distracted, but bored and discouraged, looking for meaning. But Jesus offers us the way. In him is eternal life, and Jesus says that. The way is through Jesus. That's the the way to find life. So Paul, I like that how Paul is on his way to stop and persecute the way. See how that can be an interesting sermon? We'll get to that some other year. But Paul is on his way to persecute the way and stop it. We're told later in Acts that while he's on the way, that this bright light from heaven appears. Now, it's the Middle East. It's desert. It's hot. The sun shines and it's bright. How bright would the sun have to be shining? How bright would this light have to be for all of a sudden Saul to just cower down and close his eyes because of the brightness of this light? Well, that's what happens. This incredible bright light appears. He closes his eyes, and, he, Paul, and Paul hears a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul isn't sure who this is. He probably has some ideas. He wants some clarity, so he says, who are you? And the voice replies, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus then gives Paul instructions on what to do next. Now, before this moment, Paul did not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And if we're honest, we can't really blame him. Because how many people do we know have died and then rose from the dead and we're still hanging out with them after they died? Not very many people. See, rising from the dead is ridiculous. It's not possible. It's not rational. And Paul is saying, that didn't happen. I don't believe it. That also goes against what God would have said. And so he doesn't believe it at all. But along the way, while he's on the way, Jesus intersected his path and changed the way that he was going. He was going to persecute people on the way, and instead he's in, he, he's the one, he meets the one who brings us the way. What changed Paul's life forever is an encounter with the risen Jesus. See, it seems improbable. It seems impossible, but Jesus did rise from the dead. And when Paul met Jesus, this transformed his life. He realized Jesus is the Son of God. And he began to follow Jesus and passionately do so from that point on. Nothing could convince Paul of anything else the rest of his life because he met Jesus. If you meet somebody who was dead and now they're alive and you talk to them, you believe that they rose from the dead. And that's what happened with Paul. He had an encounter with Jesus. Some of you know this story. You, in your own life, you were headed one way, and you had an encounter with Jesus. And no matter what happens, for the rest of your life, 
You will always believe and know that Jesus rose from the dead because you met him. You've talked with him. He's spoken to you. You, It may not have been in a bright light like Paul. And don't we wish we would have had that experience? How many times we say, I just need God to show up with a bright light and tell me which way to go. We want that to take place. Uh, We wish we had that. But some of us have met Jesus through our parents telling us the stories. And we've listened to those stories and we started to believe those and we've encountered Jesus. Some of those, some of us have met Jesus at summer camp when we were young at youth camp. And that's why we're big believers and supporters and kids in youth camp here because people go to these places and they encounter Jesus and these, these moments mark them and change the trajectory of their life forever. Some of us, maybe you met Jesus or encountered Jesus by your friends talking about him. And you ask questions and there was an encounter. You finally said, okay, I'm going to believe in God. Maybe some of you discovered the love of God by looking at a tree like Brother Lawrence. Or maybe you're like C.S. Lewis who did not believe in God. In fact, you tried to disprove God, but you kept running into the fact that God did exist. And eventually, C.S. Lewis finally, in the middle of working, he keeps trying to work, and he's typing away or writing, and he just keeps encountering. God keeps drawing him back to him. And he finally says, okay, I believe in you, God. And he says, I became the most reluctant convert in all of England. I love that. He just says, ah, I've encountered God. I keep trying to run from him, but I know I've met him. See, our, our encounters with God all look very, very different. We each have our own story. We think we need these Paul moments, but my point here is we can all meet Jesus along the way in our own different ways, our own different time places, at home, in a car, at church, in the garden, on a walk, wherever you are, you can find Jesus. Maybe you grew up in a house that talked about him, uh, but when you've grown up and you just don't really know Jesus and you haven't had that moment, that encounter yet, You kind of want to believe the story, but you haven't met him. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're listening. Because I believe that Jesus wants to show you that he is real, that he did exist. And here is an eyewitness. No one doubts that Paul existed. No one doubts that Paul's life changed. And the only way that makes sense is if he met Jesus personally. So if you're listening today, I pray that you are beginning to encounter Jesus this morning, that you find him and you're saying, I I don't know if I believe in this God. Well, the fact that you're listening might be proof of God saying, I'm drawing you near. You keep running into things that draw you closer to God. Are you willing to follow him? And are you willing to walk in his way? That's an invitation for you this morning. Are you willing to do so like Paul? Verses 10 through 16 starts to transition a little bit. And it's, it's a story of a man named Ananias. Well, Ananias, he's in the city of Damascus, and he gets this vision that he's supposed to go find Saul and pray with him. And Ananias says, God, listen, I don't know if you've heard about Paul or Saul. All of us in this area know him very well, and he's trying to kill us and imprison us. I'm not so sure it's a good idea for us to go find this guy. And God says, Ananias, just do what you're told. And Ananias has the courage to go do that. Again, it's a whole other sermon which would be really fascinating. This idea of doing what God asks us to do, even if it sounds crazy, Ananias does it. He risks himself and he goes and finds Saul and he prays for Saul. Saul says, I'm going to follow Jesus. He believes that Jesus is the Son of God and he starts to follow him from that point on. And so, uh, Paul though, he, he He uh, follows Jesus. But here's an interesting verse that I just have to read as Ananias is talking to God about whether or not he should go. And this is in Acts 9, 15 through 16. It says this, But the Lord said to him, Ananias, Go, for Paul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Sometimes we get this mistaken belief that if we follow Jesus, our life is going to just flow smoothly. If I accept Jesus into my life, my problems will be gone, my bills will be paid, my body will be healed, I will walk and be able to run Bloomsday at a 45-minute pace. It is going to be amazing. And yet, this isn't the story of Saul at all. 
God says, Ananias, I want you to go find Saul and tell him how much his life is going to stink for the rest of his life. It's going to be really, really hard. How many of us pray that you have somebody show up in your life and say, I want that. I want somebody to show up and say, hey, God has this great, great ministry for you. It's going to be really awful and hard, but you're going to love it. You know, I don't know. Was there an easier path here? But we, this is what the call of Jesus is. The German theologian, pastor, and spy, there's a great book about him. His name's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He said this. He said that when Christ calls a man or woman, he bids him come and die. How many are signing up for that? And yet this is the calling and invitation of God. When we follow Jesus, we are surrendering that and we're saying, Jesus, whatever you want. Whatever you want from me, I'm willing to do. Why? Why would somebody go through that? Well, for some of you guys, some of you guys have been walking through these experiences. You just seem to experience more pain than others around you. For whatever reason, there's just been a series of difficult seasons and just one thing after another after another you just find it very very difficult and i don't have great answers i wish i had a great biblical answer to say yeah this is why you suffer i'm sorry just suck it up it's going to be fine there's sometimes life is just really really hard and paul was a man who knew suffering so if you've gone through some of these seasons where it's been really difficult I invite you to stay with us over the course of the next few weeks as we see what Paul did and how he handled suffering and pain and persecution. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But Paul is a man who knew suffering well. This is what his calling was, was to suffer. So Ananias, he goes, he prays for Paul. Paul's healed. Paul's baptized. And then we get to verse 19. I'm going to read the second half of 19 and 20. It says this. For some days Paul was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. Paul starts to proclaim what he originally, just days before, did not believe. He now believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And this is the only time in Acts that Jesus is called the Son of God. And it's, to me, that's interesting. But this is, becomes a really clear lesson for Paul. For example, in Galatians 1.16, he says that God was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And in Romans 1, 1 through 4, Paul, it says this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection, by, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul's life changes because he met Jesus, the Son of God. That, that's what happened here. So one of the results is suffering and persecution, and, it's, and he, he's willing to go through it because he says, I don't know what to tell you. I've met Jesus, the Son of God. He rose from the dead. I can't change that. When we meet the Son of God, our life changes. See, if we, if we, um, just a few verses later, let's see, where am I? Here's what happens. The suffering takes place, and he's willing to go through it. Here's, let me give you a couple examples. Acts 9, 23 through 25. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. This is the next section. Hey, Jesus is the Son of God. Jews say, okay, we're now going to kill you. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Paul now was the persecutor, and now he's being persecuted. Just a couple verses later, Acts 9, 29 through 30. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. Those are Greek followers of the Jewish religion. So they are Greek practicing as Jews. But they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So people are, Paul goes to one city, starts preaching Jesus is the son of God. They try to kill him. They go, oh, we got to get you out of here. They send him to another city. They try to kill him. They try to, then they have to sneak him out of that city. This becomes the life of Paul. Well, why would a person be willing to go through all this? His he met the son of, G- son of God. He met him on the way. And for the next 30 years, his life is one of persecution. He is whipped. He is imprisoned. 
He's beaten, he's arrested, he's stoned and left for dead. His friends and co-workers betray him and abandon him. He's eventually put to death in Rome for preaching the good news of Jesus. What would keep him faithful to this call? He met Jesus. He had an encounter with Jesus that he could not deny. And because of that, he was actively telling people about Jesus because it changed his life. He went from a person who was anger, full of wrath, full of malice, full of obscene talk, and he became a person full of joy and love and grace and hope. That's what being transformed into Christ does to us. And he, he did that all because he'd met Jesus, and so he starts to take on the image of Jesus. He starts following Jesus, and Jesus transforms him. This is what happens when we start to encounter God. And so, Uh, what are we going to do with these lessons? Just a couple quick lessons for us. I'm going to wrap up in just a couple minutes. What does this mean for us? How do we encounter Jesus? How do we become to be transformed like Paul was? Well, we, we have a couple application points. And we try to give application points because it's one thing to sit in a a gathering like this. You hear a message, you say, ah, that wasn't terrible. Anyway, let's go to lunch. And then you forget about it. But what we want to do is we want to begin to put these things into practice so that we can be transformed into the image of Jesus. We want God to change us and mold us and shape us. Well, that takes practice. It takes the work of the Spirit transforming us and and changing us. But we have a participation in that. So I'm going to invite you to do a couple of things this week. The first thing I want you to do is look for Jesus. Jesus intersects our day all day long. He is with us, but we rarely notice him. One of the things I often ask my kids when we go to bed is, where did you notice Jesus today? And I make them sit and think, and I want them to pay attention to where they've encountered God. And the reason is, is because if we don't stop and think about it, we can blow right by him. But God is constantly with us. And so at night, I invite you, when you go to bed at night, and before you fall asleep, say, Where did I meet Jesus today? Where did I notice him? And begin to think about it. Where was that? Was it during worship? Was it communion? Was it when you called your family members? Was it when you had a fantastic lunch or a glorious nap? Where did you encounter Jesus? And do that at night. What it begins to do is train us to notice God more and more. So let's say tomorrow night, you think about, oh, I got to remember, to. where did I notice Jesus? Nowhere. I just didn't even look for him. Well, the next day, you don't want to do that again, so you start looking for times to notice God. So the more you start to look, the more you'll notice Him. So some some ways that I do that, uh, I try when I'm, I've been practicing that for a while, so I'll take a camera, and if I see something beautiful, I want to stop and take a picture because that helps me remember to notice God. So on my phone and my camera, I have an album called Beauty. I'll stop and I'll take a picture of a flower. Or of, the, uh, or of the skies. Or uh, maybe I'll, while I'm out on a run, I'll see turkeys. And I'll remember, why are there wild turkeys in the Spokane Valley in this neighborhood? And it'll remind me of God's goodness. And I'll take a picture. And I'll put it in that beauty thing. So I just remember that on that run, I encountered Jesus. Look for and notice Jesus. The, another one, number two, is think about Jesus. Paul would later write in Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Our mind needs to be renewed. There's a whole lot of nonsense going on up here. And sometimes there's not a lot of anything going on up here if you're like me. You just, what were you thinking? I have no idea. I don't know where I was. But we want that mind to be trained on Jesus more and more. And so what we can do is if our mind starts to wander We can capture that and say, oh, I want to think about Jesus for just a minute. There's a Catholic priest who says that when we're praying, if I am distracted 10,000 times in my prayer, that gives me 10,000 more opportunities to return back to Jesus. That's what we're trying to train our mind to do is return it back to Jesus. So if you catch yourself and say, I haven't thought about Jesus all day, that's okay. You just had a chance to train it back on Jesus. It's just all practice, so we're thinking about him and noticing him. What you think about matters. When your mind starts to wander or you catch yourself thinking about negative thoughts, worry, 
uh, envy, jealousy, whatever it is. In that moment, you can all of a sudden catch yourself and turn your thinking back to Jesus. That will help train you to think of him more and more. The other thing that I didn't mention but, uh, about Paul, but I think is really important for us to notice, when Paul was called by Jesus, he did so in a way that Paul was then able to use his gifts and his experience for God's glory. So number three is use your gifts for God. So God used Paul's unbelievable intelligence and his unbelievable experience being trained at the feet of Gamaliel. And then Paul was able to write these incredible letters. He was able to teach people deep things in theology of God because it was inside of Paul and God used Paul's gift for the greater good. So God does that today. For example, God uses your gift and your experiences. See, God, when he called me, he did not say, Isaac, I want you to be an incredible worship leader and stage designer. In my gift set and in my experience, I have very, very, very limited musical experience and no actual musical talent. And as far as stage design, I'm colorblind. It's not doesn't work very well. Do you know how many times a week I come out uh, for being dressed for the day and Annabelle and Katie say, nope, that does not match. That does not work. Or uh, I was getting, buying a pair of pants not that long ago and they were fantastic pants. They were incredible. And Katie from outside the store comes running in and yells, Isaac, no, 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 no. You know those are green, right? And I went, green? These are incredible blue pants. What are you talking about? So we're, we're debating what color they are in front of the, co- the, the cashier who was stunned by all this movement. See, the problem is, so God didn't call me to design colors. I just don't have that gift. The, the doctors call that a disability. Or, uh, so I just, I just don't have that. Uh, Andrew has the same problem, so at least one person in the house agrees with me, which is nice. <laughs> but I was raised in a pastor's house. I heard stories about the Bible my entire life. And for some reason, I have this incredible, uh, I have this ability to remember the biblical stories. I don't know how long I'm supposed to boil pasta or how long things go in the washing machine, but I can tell you how many sons of Joseph, Jacob there are and what their names are. I just, that just, one of my gifts. I can tell you these Bible stories that stick in my head. That's what God has called me to do and I have experience of growing up in a pastor's home. You too have incredible gifts and experiences. What has God called you to do? And do it. Some of you are incredible cooks. You love to bake. You can use your gift to bless people who are sick or who are well or not well and not able to get out of their house or you can make meals for them. Some of you guys like to drive. We have people that can't drive right now because of a host of reasons and so they got to make it to doctor appointments or something like that. They have errands that need to be run. You don't mind sitting in a car and driving someone along and talking to them, but you you like to drive. You have a gift and experience. Some of you guys like to sing or you like to play instruments. So you're on the worship team or you like to use your gift set. You are good and handy and so you can help us out with either your neighbors or your friends and you can hang things at your friends' houses. Whatever your gift is, God has given you gifts and talents. Use them not for your glory, but for God's. And Paul did this. God used what Paul had been given for God's glory. And we're invited to do the same thing. So, if you have never experienced Jesus, look for him. Ask him. If you have experienced Jesus, but you feel like you've wandered a little bit, you know, ah, I've had this moment with God, but really my life hasn't changed since that point. Nothing is, I'm not transformed. I'm still angry, bitter, callous, and much of a gossiper as I was 20 years ago. Well, there's a different way God is inviting you to be. There's a different way we can live. I want to pray for you because God has a separate plan. You know, I love Dallas Willard. He said this, when the Holy Spirit calls you, he calls you to have your character transformed and resulting in obedience to and abundance in Christ. Abundance in Christ. That's what we're after here. And that's so it takes place with us noticing Jesus, following him, being obedient to him, looking for him, because God wants to transform who we are. And it starts by having this encounter and then working on going his way. Your old problems, addictions, and pains, those can be transformed. If you need that encounter, I want to pray with you right now. Let's pray. Lord, you are 
so patient and good to us. I'm blown away that you take the, the old things that we've done and our gifts and talents and that you use them for your good and you transform us, God, from people who are angry, bitter, callous, discouraged, lonely, bored. And God, you take that and you give us life and you give us abundant life in you. And you, when we find your way, God, our life changes. And I know there are people hearing this this morning who need you, who need to encounter you. And Lord, will you invade their soul? Will they turn their life over to you? Help them discover you this morning and change the trajectory of their life forever. And God, there are a whole host of us that we've followed you, we've attended church for a number of years, but we're kind of the same person. Lord, we know there is a better way. You can change us. You can restore the joy that we once had. God, help us to find that in you this morning. Lord, may this be a day that marks us for the rest of our lives. In your name, amen. So we have two discussion questions. That's our way of going and practicing our faith throughout the week. So you can talk about it with your friends or family members, small groups. Two discussion questions. Number one, have I encountered Jesus? If you have, tell your friends. What was your story? Maybe it was, I I love to hear how people came to know Jesus. What was that marker? What day happened? Did you look at a tree? Did somebody drag you to church kicking and screaming? Did you see a bright light? When did you encounter Jesus? And what way am I headed? Are you headed the way of Jesus and how do you know? Or have you kind of wandered a little bit? You're kind of lost. You're kind of looking around. Where are you at? What way am I headed? Talk about those in your discussion questions today, but let me give you a prayer of blessing as we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Intersection, it's a great and beautiful day. I hope you go in peace. Thanks for being here.